Good morning, Doug here from the Hundredfold Journey. Thanks for joining us on this Sundays with Doug, where we are coming alongside of you uh, on your journey, and we're helping us to rewire your brain, build new habits, and create a new identity. Because a hundredfold is about a group of people that are looking to find their true identity, and by doing so, finding God's true identity. You have the power to choose. And we're actually going to uh, deep dive into that subject more today. But as a reminder, each week we talk about the 10 truths. And the 10 truths, we're asking that you memorize these, apply them, and meditate upon them. Because these truths were true for Jesus, as well they are true for you. And what I've been asking those that have been joining online is, is possibly share an event that happened this last week where these 10 truths showed up. Uh, so if there's someone out there that would like to share an event this last week where they saw one of these 10 truths in action. So who would like to share? Um, I'll go first. So um, I follow a girl on social media who, she has a story of, she actually went to prison and she turned her life around. She used to do drugs and it's a story it's a really amazing story of recovery and just becoming a better person and I find her really interesting she's my age and um she's recently been posting some things that are kind of I guess you could say like lashing back or attacking her haters like the people who put her down yeah and what a recent video was kind of um pretty aggressive kind of saying you know like I'll I'll come after you if you put me down and oh wow I my first reaction was to you know take her side and jump on the train of you know yeah you know like everybody needs to be quiet and <laughs> and then I stopped myself and I was like you know what if I say this what is that doing it's putting hate out there it's putting mm -hmm. even though I thought I was kind of sticking up for her but I I stopped myself and said you know what like that's not coming from love or positivity at all and um you know the old me would have definitely done that and kind of jumped on that train but um you know I just started to think like the more positivity and love that I put out there the more I'll get back and that's what I want to do and so um it it reminded me of the 10 truth that is life is a mirror which reflects back what I truly believe and think mm -hmm. and I just felt so much better after I stopped myself from doing that and I reminded myself you know you have to just look away from that negative energy and put out you know positivity it's a choice every day is a choice what I if I want to be grateful if I want to be positive that's what I need to put out there excellent excellent and <clears throat> that mirror reflects back what you truly believe and think. So when you didn't react the same way that you historically had, it's reflecting back that, hey, you have changed. So, um, you know, that mirror can reflect both the positive and the negative, if you will, of the changes that are occurring in you. Uh, and either, well, it's always confirming what you truly believe and think. Yeah, very good. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. So we are starting a new series called The Heart of a Hundredfold. We've been on a path of different teachings, the seed and the sower, your dwelling place of God, uh, freedom from religious bondage, living from the unseen. Uh, and all of those are different descriptions of a hundredfold as we, again, are on this journey together. We're embarking on this journey and we're, we're hearing new concepts, new ideas, and new thoughts. Uh, the, the heart of the hundredfold, the focus is, is primarily going to be on some, some pretty foundational things uh, that a hundredfold stands on. And, that, and the first one that we are going to talk about is identity. Um, the heart of a hundredfold is about identity. In fact, that's our, our primary statement, right? Um, it's, it's where when we see who we truly are, we see who God is. And it, that's all about identity, the identity of who we are and the identity of who God is. So that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. And uh, there's a lot of information here. So we're going to take it nice and slow. I, I don't want to go too fast. 
So I'm going to ask for some participation. So please, um, you know, share what's on your heart. But um, but we're going to go slow and really dig into what it means to see what our true identity is. I've shared this many a time. Well, maybe not many times, but uh, a few times where this is my true identity. This is your true identity, whether you believe it or not, because this is the way God views you, right? We are the bride of Christ. We are adorned. We are loved. Um, all of our needs are constantly met, smiling, happy, joyful. Um, that's our true self. That's our true identity. That's what is inside of us. This is the way God created us. But there's a lot of outside influences that have come upon us, whether it's through our, our parents, our upbringing, our friends, our neighbors, um, experiences, where that tends to get squashed, if you will. And we'll describe that a little bit more detail as we get into it. But please remember that this is always what is truly inside of us. So what we're going to be talking about this week and maybe the next couple of weeks are what are my roadblocks to believing that this is truly true for me? What are those roadblocks? So the way, the way that, um, that I'd like to attack this is we tend to have negative definitions that we've heard and maybe believed from religion, from others the way I view myself and the way God views me. Um, so the question is, is, is which view, which do we count as our identity? So what I'd like to do is, is kind of go through and, and answer some of these questions. So let's start with uh, religion's view of me. So just asking those that are listening, what are some negative definitions uh, that religion has told us about our identity? And I'll just type them out as you do it, just so that I, I capture some of the notes here. How about religion? What what uh, what have we heard about our identity from religion? Um, I'll go uh, that not everyone is free or saved. Right. <clears throat> right. Yep. Okay. Good. And then I would just, the first thing that pops in my head is just that we are inherently bad and sinners, not inherently good. Good. Okay. What else has religion taught us? Uh, segregation. Yeah. Within church and within ourselves as well. Yep. Yep. Uh, with uh, with others and with God, right? That there is a separation. Yes. Yep. One that I've I've heard is is not now, not yet which basically means that, yes, that bride is you, but not now and not yet. It's not going to be until, until we die and get to heaven. Yeah, and I also would say that it, we have to do a lot of work to get there. It's, it's work-based, going to church and praying. Doing all the right things. Right. Oh, um, religion tells you that, oh, no, sorry, it's a, trying to think of a, another one. Um, I mean, religion kind of tells us that we have to go to church, we have to pray, we have to do Bible study. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've heard, uh, I've heard it said this way about uh, work-based doing all the right things is the way religion has it structured is 
it sets you up for failure because it only tells you what you can do, what you need to do on your very best. So your very best is you, and I'm just gonna give, give an example. You wake up at six o'clock in the morning and you have your quiet time for half an hour and then you pray for half an hour and, and, and then uh, and then you, at lunchtime, you know, you have a time of prayer. Um, then on Sunday, you go to church and, and you lead a Bible study, right? It's, it's what you can do on your very best, but on your worst, right? Maybe you wake up late or you have a cold and you don't get up at six, you get up at seven and then you miss your quiet time. Then all of a sudden it heaps the condemnation on you. You're never going to be good enough, right? So it only, religion only sets you up to perform at your very best and anything less than that there's guilt and condemnation i, I have a, a, another another one it's yep. it's kind of sm small but uh the pressure of tithing yep yep that if you if you don't tithe more than a dollar you kind of looked at as oh he's not he's not helping i don't know some people have that are pressured by that yep yeah give to god to be blessed yep and then how about uh how about others view of me in regards to my identity and that could be friends family neighbors co-workers how to how do they view me and how does that impact my identity are you talking about the uh, being a part of the hundredfold how do I, how do others view me or well whether it's part of a hundredfold or just just negative definitions that we've heard and maybe believed about who we are oh you're talking about how people view me at, you know being having religious bondage you can answer it any way you want but just how how they view you and your and how we take that as our identity Right. And let's just say it's your mom or dad that says you're never going to be good enough or you're ugly or, you know, that's the view that we receive from others. And then it becomes a negative definition of who I am. Other view. Well, I know that when I was, you know, very religious people, others viewed me as as forceful. Okay. Forceful in my teaching. Because religion is forceful on teaching me. Got it. Yep. I mean, it's kind of maybe the same thing as what Lonnie said, but it feels like in religion, there's a hierarchy and that, you know, there's definitely people, maybe if they're part of Catholicism or whatever it may be, where they, they think that they're better because they believe different things. So if there's judgment yes good good feel judged yep yep you know i remember uh, there was times with me growing up you know i was told, told i wasn't going to amount to anything i uh, just saw a negative talk of you don't know, change your ways or you know and i don't think ways were really bad i think it's the way you know some of us are brought up in order to change something like that, you know, it took me to actually find God to reverse that and not take that negativity anymore. And um, what, what negativity did you feel? What, what, what definitions did you have about yourself based on other people's opinion of you? It got, it got to a point to where, let's say like, even positives, it, it took me to a place where even if something was positive said to me that I did not pay attention to that it was positive, I always took it negative. So I grew up with a lot of negativity growing up. So anything that I encountered um, could be positive, but somebody will argue with me and say, you know, I'll say, you know, I'll act negative to it. But they're like, Ronnie, why are you acting negative if something's so positive? You know, and I never got to see those positivities, you know, what they really look like, you know. Now, is that, is that because you didn't think you were call it worthy enough or I wasn't good enough. I yeah. wasn't worthy enough. I've been to so many different churches too, to, yep. you know, that it's uh, the judgment came from all the different churches, you know, just, yep. you know, you need to do it this way. <laughs> you need to follow God this way. And I go, well, what's wrong with uh, the saying that you say we're two or three gathered 
God mm. is there, you know, so it doesn't mean I have to be in the building in order to be with God, you know, so I, I yeah, I took everything negative. I even took yeah. God negative in the beginning, you know, yeah. just so many different ways. Right. Like, Good. I always, you know, I don't know why God never has done anything to me, but I guess that's the way I, I related with God by saying, why is this happening to me? You know, but you think a lot of it is. So just like religion, right? Others also told you about who God was and gave you their definition. Yeah. And, yeah. and downplayed my, uh, my definition of them. Yeah. You know, like my, my definition doesn't matter, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I, I think all of us see him in a different manner. He's the same to everyone, right. but we all look at him in a different manner. It's like how I would look at my parents in a different manner than I would look at your parents. Yeah. You know, um, but without passing judgments, you know, it's it's that's the scene, not the unseen, you know. Got it. Yeah. Anyway, how about uh, my view of me? How would we? Now, these are negative definitions, right? I know um, we're starting to understand our new view of me, but the negative definitions that we have of ourselves, um, how does that, what are those beliefs? Well, my view of me when I was, you know, religious, more religious was, how come this isn't enough? Hmm why why isn't this helping me you know why am i why am i a loser christian you know i'm like the only one that's not happy why can't i be better or do better okay what else You know, I feel that way about that too. Like what Michael said, you know, it's, you know, it's, I'm not enough anymore, but I also feel that, you know, with all of that, it's turned me into a loner. Like I prefer to be alone now rather than have a company and stuff like that. You know, company is good every now and then, but I guess it's like that old saying where grandparents say, yeah, bring the grandkids, we'll spoil them and then send them back home to you on a hyped up on sugar. You know, that's kind of how I feel about it. But uh, that's how I used to feel. Uh, but I enjoy it now moderately, though. You know, so with that, I, you know, it's being by, it, it's made me to be just a loner with all the negativity. And that's what I view of myself. I can see myself as a loner. I, right. But what's what's the belief there that that you are destined to be alone? Because there's there's got to be a belief. So, what what is it about? Well, I used to have this saying: if I didn't get married by the time I was forty three, I figured I'm going to be alone and never be married. Well, I ended up getting married. I think at thirty eight or somewhere around there. So, anyhow, I always felt my I was destined to never have to be. I was felt I was destined to be alone, never be married, never have a family. And that's because so trying trying to get to the the belief, right? Asking the question why. Why did well, you that, believe that? Well, that'll go back to others, uh, you know, viewed me of that, you know, and just that uh, you ain't never going to get married. You can't keep a marriage. You're, you're no good. You know, or just all that stupid stuff, you know, all the broken stuff that has ever been there that I've seen and heard and gone through. You're going to be a, you're going to be that apple that doesn't fall far from the tree. That's going to be just like what you grew up with. So, so you, you had a sense, you had a sense of being broken. Yeah. That was yeah. just the belief for the, like the longest time. Uh, yeah. But, you know, uh, and that that's what took into the views of me. But to say for the view of me now, um, where I'm at, uh, I, I view a bit a bigger picture, you know. Um, I get to start on my own and not have everybody or care about what religion is going to say of me anymore or how others are going to view me anymore. Right. Where God has me as me looking at myself in the mirror that's who i'm viewing you know and i have to live with myself every day you know to the decision and choices that i make so yeah. and that leads towards the aspect of god's view of me i want to prove i want to do right by him i don't have to prove to nobody anymore it's it's none of that i just 
get up every day and do what I have to do, whatever that may be for that day, you know, right now it's resting. So, so jumping to God's view of me, I, taking your comment there, I need to prove myself as worthy to God, right? Yeah. So the way I view God, again, with the negative definitions was I need to prove myself as worthy for God yeah. to love me or pay attention to me. Yeah. So I, have, I actually have one for my view of me, and that is I'm an everlasting sinner. Uh, yes. That I, I, I'll never stop being a sinner. That's just something you can't ever stop having that label when you're, you know, when you're around a lot of other people in church, you just can't get away from that label. Oh, you're a sinner. Oh, I'm a sinner too. We're all yeah. sinners. Right. Right. We're all sinners together in a center pot. <laughs> yeah. All right. And anything okay. else, any other God, negative God, God, definitions about God. my identity? God's view of me would, would have been punishing, pun, punisher, you know, uh, you, you know, you're, you got to do better. God's view of me is, you know, um, we're in this together, but I'm still expecting you to be on your best behavior. And if you don't do that, you, that's your dislike is going to be terrible. Better behave. <clears throat> you know, I, there was something back in the day, I took a cognitive class and it was a random that the, the uh, instructor, she, uh, she just came out of the blue and started this circle group of uh, asking questions. And she goes, why is your shirt wrinkled, Bonnie? And I go, because uh, I didn't, you know, she goes, no, why is your shirt wrinkled? And she kept interrupting me because what I was doing was making an excuse rather than saying, because I put it on like this and I like it like this. If you don't, it's all right. Huh. Uh, so what I mean by that is with that cognitive, she took me out of, I was always making excuses to please somebody else hmm. for what they wanted to hear, not hmm. for what, for me, you know? Yeah. So I look at uh, excuses, you know, that that's where we get, uh, that's, I get a view of me. If I make excuses, you know, because sometimes I just want to blow a person off or, you know, rather than just saying it ain't none of your business. Yeah. <laughs> My dryer wasn't working. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So um, there's probably hundreds more, but we, kind of scratched the surface. And I know for, for me, uh, the identity that, that I receive, um, much of it had to do with religion. I think that's why those were so easy to come out because uh, I now see them differently than I did before. So they're a little bit easier for me to identify the negative definitions that religion has put on me. It gets a little harder when I get into the other views of me and my view of me. Uh, and there's hard work that we need to do um, to identify what those definitions are about my true identity. So part of the process of this study today is to kind of deep dive and take a look at those um, and feel what they feel like and understand what they truly are and how they change the way I respond or react to, uh, to people, but more importantly, to the truth, the truth of who I really am. So notice the order in which we covered these beliefs. It started with religion, then others, then my view of me and God's view of me. It's not until we resolve God's view of me that true transformation can occur. Agree with God about how he views you. So really, it should be the other way around. Everything should be based upon God's view of me. God's view of me, my view of me, others' view of me, and religion's view of me in that order. And God's view of me trumps them all, right? And in fact, there probably only should be one category, how God views me, and then everything else is, is out of the way. In fact, that's probably the way I should phrase it now that I think about it more. But um, when we understand that, then 
that's what we draw upon. That's what influences us. And in fact, uh, Rachel, to your story, that's what you drew upon to not respond like you normally would have is you're drawing upon God's view of you. And maybe this was the thought process. I'll just put words in your mouth. Maybe the thought was, hey, that's not the way a child of God would, would respond. That's not the way that bride, right? Remember the picture of the bride. She wouldn't respond that way. Therefore, I won't because God views me as a life-giving spirit out of love, out of compassion. Um, so that is then becomes the motivation for our, the way we respond, the way we live. We're living from the unseen. And it's crazy you say that because I think that God's view of me and my view of me go one on one together to to change, you know, uh, others of you, you know, view of me and religions of view of me. Because, you know, if you if you say, hey, you know, God loves me regardless of any actions that I do, then you can go into your own mind and say, OK, well, if God loves me, then I love myself mm-hmm. in a way, you know. And those two go back to are, are like go hand in hand with each other. Yep, exactly. So how does this true transformation or understanding your identity occur? How does it actually happen? And there's, there's a process that, that occurs. First off, God's love is continually being poured out but I need to be open to receive it. It's a choice. It's a choice. But God's love is continually being poured out. It's not being withheld. It's not being withdrawn. It's just constantly being poured out upon me. But again, I need to be open. And how, by way of what? How does that then, you know, if I'm open to receive it, how does then it come in? And it comes in through God's truth, which is continually being poured out, and it opens your soul and makes you more aware, right? So I can sit there and say, um, I am this bride, and this is the way I view myself as perfect and whole. Sorry, I have that bride, but then the truth comes in, and the truth is, is that I'm a bride. All my needs are constantly met. Uh, You could say the 10 truths. You could go to the promises of God. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Um, uh, I've given you everything for life and godliness. Uh, 1 John 4, 17, as he is, so I am in the world. Those are all truths. Those are God's truths towards us. So the way God's love filters down to us is through the truths. So how do we know God loves us? Is because all my needs are constantly met. That's the truth, okay? So God's truth then makes us aware that he loves us and in a very specific way. But then what what happens is humility opens me to God's love and God's truth, which then transforms my soul. I allow God's love and truth to transform me. I allow it, allowing the love and the truth to be the perfect ingredient needed for my transformation, right? So God's love is constantly being poured out. It comes out, I'll call it in packets, packets of truth, but then I have to be humble enough to receive it. I have to be open to be able to receive it. Because if I'm not open to it and I say, no, that doesn't apply to me, that truth is not true for me, then to some degree, that packet of truth bounces off, right? It doesn't penetrate. It doesn't go in. And transformation cannot occur because you're not humble enough to receive it. So going back to our definitions, our negative definitions, which truth do we believe? Do we believe the seen truth or do we believe the unseen truth, which is God's truth? And then the last thing is feeling and releasing all the false beliefs and fears about my definitions of who I am and who God is, having an openness, being at rest, and allowing space for love to enter in. 
So there's an emotional attachment that we have to these negative beliefs. For example, you know, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. You know, that's brought down by religion. Uh, I'll never be good enough. That's brought down by our parents. <clears throat> There's pain associated with that. You know, I'm never going to be good enough. And so if you go back and you go back to the why as you answer all the questions about why, why do you believe that you're never going to be good enough? And more than likely, it'll go back to your childhood and identify a moment in time where, you know, your mom or dad says you're never going to be good enough because you didn't hit a home run or you didn't do your homework right or whatever. So we have to feel those feelings and, and release those. Can, can I say something real quick? Please. Um, I think the, the most difficult thing that I had was that religion had pointed out these verses out of the Bible that can be really intimidating and, and scary. And they're saying, these are the verses you need to believe this. And there's a lot of other verses that are never, never pointed out that are kind of hidden That's until, right. you, yeah. until, until you bring them out. And then when you bring those ones out, religion goes, Oh no, 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 those aren't true though. There's that's not, that's out of context. That's not, that's not true. So for me, I've had the most difficult time of breaking free from, Hey, you know, there is other stuff in the, in the Bible and you know that was written a long 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 time ago not saying that it's not true but that you can't let that fear of some of those bible verses keep you from living the life that you want to live um yeah. so that's the one thing we do have to kind of take a step back from and go okay because that's every person i run into that's still very religious goes well how well, how could you interpret interpretate the bible that way it's not that's not the way it's meant but then you ask them and, and it feels like it's the same re repetitive stuff you've heard your whole life. And yeah. just like, wait a minute, you know, you know, hell's not real. You know, things start clicking in your head. But we have to remember that our job is not to change other people, but just to plant seeds. Right. You know, right. So, it's the frustration. so it's a little fr frustrating, not not in a bad way of like, hey, you know. That's you can see the break from religious bondage and prove, you know, when you start looking at it, like, Hey, I used to kind of sound like that. And I had a lot of pain. I, I wasn't being honest with my, in myself, you know, I hid that pain by saying, Hey, I'm a Christian. I do this. I do that. I go to church. I, I, I read the Bible, but in, inside there was this little pain saying, you know, there I'm not enough. I don't have enough, but the hundredfold it teaches you that you are enough because you are, the I am, you know, so just wanted to say that. Yeah, you know, when you say that too, Mike, you know, me growing up, my grandfather, man, I was forced to go to the Jehovah Witness Church, man, and eat them all. <coughs> and I mean, it literally was always forced. I had to wear this ugly green suit every time we went, man. I hated that line of being colored suit. Anyway, but you know, it was always a forceful thing. And here, you know, in any other uh, like churches I went to, too, you know, there was always something very forceful. But it was uh, when I looked at it, I always seen I always took it as the opposite of what they're saying. Because I had this one church I went to, uh, St. Paul's Baptist. Good church, good, uh, good, um, good pastor. Um, he moved out from Oakland. God blessed him to move to Idaho and take uh, to this church, pastor at the church. But he found within his own deacons and I seen, you know, I think it was more with the scene, how they would, they, they preach to us and they're telling, the deacons are telling us we got to act this certain way in order to have God with us. Mm. But then there would be a, there was a Thanksgiving dinner that they threw for the homeless. And, you know, they leave their stuff, you know, the uh, deacons and stuff, they leave their stuff out there in the, you know, open area. And then they're judging and looking at these homeless, like they're going to steal their purse or feel this and that and I was like and I overheard it one time and I was like how is that being Christian like you order me to follow these rules but then yet I hear you act like this and say like this you know so I yeah. started looking at to believe 
how that Bible, how you were saying with the Bible, there's good things that are in that Bible that kind of, you know, that go along with that negative of how they're saying. Yeah, and and I think what I've discovered, and Michael, you kind of touched on this, is is there's verses in the Bible that aren't talked about much. And for example, Ephesians 1, where it says we've been chosen before the foundation of the world to be holy and blessed. And, and we've been granted everything that we need for life and godliness. And that as he is, so I am in this world. And, you know, the new covenant, which says your sins and lawless deeds, I will remember no more. In that order, I don't think I've ever heard a, a, a preacher basically share those truths about who I really am. And instead, you know, they, they go to the, the negative ones about what I need to do or, or not do or repent or confess. Um, so, so again, all, all of that is we've got to work through, uh, each of those, um, negative beliefs because we're all going to, to carry and hang on to these, these old beliefs about ourselves and about who God is, but we have to be open. We have to be humble enough to receive that truth. And, and Michael, to your point, is we can't force people. Uh, it's God's work to transform us. It's not our job. Our job is just to rest, to be open, to allow the space for love to enter. That's what our role is. But we get the message through many different ways that there's things that we need to do. You got to pray more. You got to fast more. But a but a but a bump, whatever it is. Um, but our job is just to rest and allow God to do the transformation and being humble enough to say, I was wrong. You're right. That's hard to do for a lot of people. Hey, uh, so when uh it was Luther, okay, so I, I heard this growing uh growing up. I, I don't really know what to believe of it, but was Luther was casted out of heaven, right? Is he yeah, so Lonnie, let, let's don't go on, down that just, bunny trail, but uh, no. but yeah, there, there's it, a whole... it, it, but the question I was going to go into it, well, it, it was going to go into this, but never mind, we'll do this another time. I was just thinking something. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of negative beliefs, um, and you know about what happened and when, and you know. A lot of it is is symbolism. A lot of it is allegory about what this life is truly about. Um, so we have to look at it with a different lens, a different pair of eyes as we're interpreting, um, you know, what what those true messages are. So let's talk about uh, transforming, right? Um, and the key key thing here is we cannot transform ourselves. We can't work harder and press harder and do all these things in order to transform ourselves like an automobile right we we have a limited capacity and i'm just using this as an example right this car you know is designed to fit five people in two in the front three in the back so it has a limited capacity it can't jump or create or become a bus which can hold more people there's a transformation that needs to occur um, so this is just a simple example that um, what what God is asking us or, or what God is um, doing for us through the inside out, right, through the unseen, is he's transforming our lives so that we can become a school bus, if you will, right? He increases our capacity to, to live this life and to love and, you know, the fruits of the spirit. But it's the it's God working in us. So our only job is just to say, God, I know I'm I'm limited, and I need your transforming power by receiving His love and the truth which breaks through. That makes sense. So it's God's love that does the transforming. All I can do is receive it, and humility is the key that unlocks it along with your free will choice. So God doesn't, he still keeps our, our free will intact. So he's not going to do something that we're, we're, 
refusing. We're raising our fist and saying, nope, I don't believe that. It's not going to happen. <clears throat> we have to be humble enough to, to receive it. And humility comes with a free will choice, right? I'm choosing to allow God to transform me. That's when transformation occurs. But when we're stubborn and we say, no, I only believe what other people say about me. I only believe what religion. I only believe what I tell myself. That's where we get stuck. It's not to say God can't transform those lives because he does all the time. But there's, it's got to break through. It's got to break through. So what we're talking about is, is this illustration of, of a butterfly where it, it basically transmutes into a different, a different being, right? From a car to a bus to increase its capacity from a caterpillar that lives its life on the ground to a butterfly that, uh, that can then fly. Second Corinthians says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is past, behold, new has come. That's the transforming life that God has within us. We just have to be humble enough to receive it. And what's interesting is the caterpillar goes into a state of rest in order for that transformation to occur. Basically dies and is reborn. Any questions before I move on? Well, the thing that I really find interesting is God wants to experience, is experiencing life through us. So when we say, you know, no, I don't want God's love, we're not limiting his experience, but we're limiting our experience with a co-creator. You could say it that way right? Because God is still within man, but he's not expressing himself through love through that person because they're choosing to push it down. But the experience yeah. is still there. Because the weird thing is, is that I've met people since, you know, I've learned more about the hundredfold that don't want anything to do with even the word of God. Yeah, I still, I can still see God in them. Mm -hmm. Is that just because they have the freedom of choice to be able to say, you know, no, I, I just don't want anything to do with that. Yeah. So that's, that's a really good way to, to view people. Michael is that God is already in them. They just don't know it yet because they haven't come to the realization of their identity. So just like me, I've gone through a transformation where I have allowed God's truth to come in and see myself in a new way. And now I see others in a new way. So rather than me never being good enough, when I look at other people, that's the way I viewed them. Well, they're not, not going to be good enough. And now I don't, I see myself as love. Therefore I see them as loved. Yeah. Cause you, cause you can say, I don't want anything to do with God, but not be a bad person. And since you can, you know, still have the ability to love others and God is love then that is being God and showing love, regardless whether you don't want anything to do with it or not. Good, good that point. That goes, goes back to the car illustration. We have a limited capacity to love. So everybody has this ability to love because that's the way we were created in his image and his likeness. We just keep pushing it down, pushing it down, right? But we all have that same capacity to love. But it's not until we get transformed that our love can can break the boundaries and, and basically live the life that Jesus lived because he was fully manifest. He was a full butterfly, if you will. And his capacity was, went from limited to unlimited. In fact, maybe that's the way I should have uh, written this is, as uh, is we become unlimited. And you know, so, when you said that, Mike, I got a, my one of my best friends growing up, uh, his mom was uh, she didn't believe. Hey, Lonnie, could you get a little closer to the mic? We we can oh. you're kind of far yeah. away. Can you hear me now? Um, I had uh, my my one of my best friends younger growing up. His mom, uh, she was a, she was a very loving and caring person, and like how Michael was describing, there can be people that are like that. 
Um, and but she didn't believe in God, nor did she believe in the devil, you know. But she, not to say she didn't, she just she had a different belief altogether. But she was just a kind, loving. Um, she was a nurse at St. Rose Hospital in Hayward, but you know she cared about people. And I don't know why she, I, I don't. I never got really the reason why she never thought that it was God or or anything else. She just never had that belief that there's somebody else up there, you know, or. Because I used to ask her, like, then how do you think you got here on earth? And, you know, she would just say, I was born. Hmm. You know, but she was grown with a loving family, too. You know, that, you know, I don't know. I wouldn't call her an atheist, but I wouldn't call her, I wouldn't call her anything that she just lived life, you know, and good. And religion would tell you, oh, she's going to hell. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But she was the kindest She's the most kindest. I mean, you can see in her the glow, like as if she was baptized or something, you know, I mean, that that's the, the personality, the character of who she was. So what, what's interesting about that is because she was not religious, she didn't have the fear, guilt or condemnation. She just loved from a loving space within her heart. It wasn't because she had to, it's because she wanted to, which is where a transformed life lives from. It's not because you have to it's because you want to okay that, well that makes sense now that yeah that's yeah because it was kind of it's kind of weird i never understood you know where she stood with that you know okay yep all right <clears throat> so what does transformation look like uh transformation is surrendering to the emotion and pain of negative and false beliefs i can then feel the pain of the error completely I can then empty myself to receive the truth of who God says I am. So think of it like, you know, like a bottle, right? And we're filled to the brim with, um, with negative beliefs. And we have to start emptying it so that we can become empty. And that's humility, right? It's my, not my way or the highway. It's you're open um, to, to what God has for you. Um, but it, it, there's a process that needs to take place. You have to, you have to feel the pain of the error um, and why you believe that, why you believe that, you know, you're never good enough or, you know, God's, God's an angry God. You have to go through that process. So then what ends up happening is, you know, the old limiting beliefs come out and then the true identity of God's truth comes in. And then that's where we have a new identity, right? The old has passed away. Behold, new has come. And quite honestly, this is an ongoing process. Um, there's always going to be negative or limiting beliefs that we have to go through. And it's a process. But just like the container, right? Eventually, it's going to go down. You fill it, you fill it with, with more of God's truth about how he views you and your true identity and that pushes down and then there might be another negative belief that comes in right so it's it's uh that part is you know i'll call it work right we have to we have to do the inner work uh to see where those negative beliefs are coming in because they're always coming in they're coming in from our childhood they're coming in from our co-workers they're coming in from the world you know, everything that's happening in the world now, um, you know, those all come together and we have to filter through those as best we can. And that's why we started with the, you know, religion's view, others view, my view and God's view. <clears throat> we, we have to identify where those beliefs are coming from and, um, and understand what they are. And then by that way, we can allow God humbly, right, to, to take those up to God and, and he'll clear those out for us and he'll transform those into our, our true identity. Okay, um, I'm going to be kind of starting another segment, but it's, uh, we're on the hour right now. Um, I'm thinking this might be a good stopping point uh, before we move on to the, uh, the next segment of of what i want to share and maybe we'll save this for next week so what i like uh what i'd like us to do is to think through our list 
of these views of me and really focus on what those beliefs are and where they're coming from and to feel the feeling of, for example, you know, one of them would be, would God really send someone that didn't believe to everlasting eternal punishment? You know, that's a belief that I had and seeing that, hearing that, feeling that, what would that feel like? And allowing those emotions to come out and, and understand that God isn't that way and that he does love and his love is everlasting and forgiving. Um, so then going through the process of, of uh, you know, getting those old beliefs out and putting the new belief in. And there has to be a new belief. You know, what, what is replacing that? Um, and replacing that is, you know, God is love. Um, he, he's not a, a vengeful God. Uh, if you look in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, which is the love chapter, it, it never accounts, it never holds an account of wrong. Um, the new covenant, their sins and lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Jesus on the cross says, you know, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then saying, it is finished. Uh, and then in Acts chapter two, where it says his spirit's been poured out on all flesh. Does it all mean all? Does, does it mean that everyone has God's spirit in them? You know, we have to really look at that and feel the feeling of knowing that those are true. Can I, can I just say just one thing? Yep. Um, I think the one thing that a hundredfold has shown me in the heart of the hundredfold is my biggest fear was death. And I think that's a lot of people's fear um, is I was afraid of the concept of heaven and hell, mm -hmm. you know, because what if I say I'm a Christian, I'm going to church, but then behind the scenes, I'm not doing all the things that religion tells me, oh, you have to do or, or else things are just, you're going to go and burn forever. So now that I have been able to have peace of, hey, I don't believe hell is a place where I go and I die, but I don't necessarily believe all the things that the Bible talks about heaven, I have my own belief about it, but I'm not scared anymore. So now I can live in the moment. Yes. Because yes. I believe religion, what it did for me is panic in the moment instead of, and you know, you're resting is because you're not panicking in the there moment. Right. That's how you know you're resting. Resting is for, for me isn't sleeping. It's, are you stressing in the moment? Are you stressing about bills? Are you stressing about the things you did in the past that could be considered the ultimate sin? Are you stressing about that? Or am I just relaxing in the moment and not worrying about that? That's how you kind of know, hey, you know, I'm not scared of, uh, of death. I'm, I'm well, you know, I'm scared now. I feel of not living in the moment. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes. You know, I'm not scared of anything. But I just wanted to say that the, the big, I think, hundredfold experience is bringing you away from the concept of oh hey you have to fear you know a, a place that you're going when you die you yep. can enjoy the place that you're at now and that's inside your heart inside your mind at peace so yep. it's awesome it's great i love this yeah and john john 14 says you know heaven heaven is within you it, it doesn't come by observation it's not what you see it's within you and, you know, later in John 15, it says that I and the father are one and you are in me and I am in you and, and we're one. So there is no separation. And if the definition of heaven is where God is, which it is, God is in me. So heaven on earth. And no reason to fear death. In fact, death is to some degree, you know, the, the old stinky thinking you've died to that uh, in fact, you know, maybe even looking at the, uh, the butterfly, right? The, the butterfly has, has died, but it was here, right? It was actually here, right? We died to the limitations of our beliefs. And then we've been transformed um, by God's love and by his truth and the humility to be able to receive it and say, yes, thank you. Do you know that we kind of are, we've already died. So why wouldn't you want to just live right now? I mean, there you go. the future has already happened. You know, it's it just enjoy the beautiful. And that's the thing about everlasting love. And there's the proof of everlasting love is that, you know, it's uh, you can feel that. 
you know, you can, it's, it's a wonderful feeling, a peaceful feeling, you know, no anxiousness. Yep. Very good. Are you know All right. So, oh, good. No, go ahead. I was just going to conclude, but go ahead, Lonnie. I was just going to say, you know, one thing that I've found is, you know, we're talking about death and all that. Growing up, I'd never been scared to die because the way I lived, what I was doing, I knew the consequences. So death never feared me. I never feared death. However, what I'm finding, what I'm learning now is that what I'm, I think I'm fearing the most is my own true identity because I've never seen it and never really got to know who it is. So that, that to me, I do have a fear of that. Not that I think it's going to turn out bad or scary or it can't turn out no worse than what I grew up doing anyway. But I think it's the fear of more that the goodness that is happening to me, the good things that I do see, the good things I feel inside now that, you know, it's that identity of how am I going to be towards others too, you know, and can I remain that way and not fall back? To old ways? That's all I had to say. Yeah. Yeah, so you need to answer the questions, you know, you know, humility, willingness, allowing time, you know, time spent and asking why, you know, why do you have those fears? So the idea for this week is, you know, removing my roadblocks to believing. Okay, so originally we asked, what are the roadblocks to believing? And now we want to start removing those roadblocks and, and where they came from and allowing us to, to ask those questions about, you know, why do I believe that? And then feeling that feeling, you know, um, maybe you don't feel that you're good enough and allow those feelings to come so that that can be removed and then replaced with the truth of that you are worthy, that this is the way God views you, regardless. Um, while we're on this journey, I have a 21 days of identity, and this is on our website at the hundredfoldjourney.com. And on here, you can see this uh, 21 days of identity where it's uh, created for the purpose to know your identity, to open your eyes, to experience Holy Spirit. And uh, each day is a, um, a discussion about our true identity. So please go ahead and click on, uh, click on this, but you can see what our true identity is, uh, chosen, his possession, his bride, et cetera. But um, while maybe we're, you know, this week is pull this up and, and start going through the 21 days of identity. Okay, so that's on our website. And then of course, uh, we always talk about, you know, the difference between 30, 60 and 100 fold. So the 30 fold is, I know my identity, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and I need to confess my sins daily, or God's favor will not be with me. Okay, so 30-fold, they still have the Holy Spirit in them. They, you know, they still have God's Spirit in them, but that's what they believe. 60-fold is my identity is in Christ. I know he died for my sins, but there is work that needs to be done. Confession, binding, and loosening here on earth. Then God will bless me, and I can break through. Versus the hundredfold, which is I'm choosing to believe what God believes about me, right? It's not about what I'm hearing externally. It's about what's inside, the unseen. And, G and God says, I am holy. I am blameless. And there's nothing I need to do. Perfect love casts out all fear. And that's what God is pouring out on all of us is, is uh, his perfect love. And that comes by way of rest. But then we always have to ask ourselves our question, how good is God? And the way you answer that determines your yield. Is God really that good that he did all of that for me and that's who I am, that bride? The answer is yes. Please continue to work on your 10 truths. And again, go to the website, thehundredfoldjourney.com. You can pull down that 21 days of identity. And then, of course, you can always join us on Facebook and um, ask questions or see this uh, more content on our Facebook. All right, that's it for this morning. Uh, we'll call this part one and we'll get into part two next week and we'll dig a little bit deeper into how we break through uh, those limiting beliefs. All right, so thanks everybody for joining and uh, we will see you next week. All right, have a good day. All right, bye for now. Have a good day.